How would you feel about a robot covered in real human skin? Well, you don't have to imagine anymore because robots covered in real human skin exist. Thank you, science. Since robots first became a thing, they've divided opinions. Many people are concerned, possibly even afraid of their abilities, whether they be physical or with the rise of AI mental. But as they become more and more integrated into our daily lives, one way or another, we're gonna have to get used to them. So what have scientists been doing to help make us feel more comfortable around robots, I hear you ask? Covering them in real human flesh. <laughs> Welcome to Brain Noises, thanks for joining. I'm Chloe, science communicator and recovering physicist, and on this channel, we talk about the thoughts and feelings that pass through my mind, generally relating to science, but I cannot make any promises. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, or at least willing to listen to while you hang up your washing, then subscribe for more. So, robots wearing human skin. This is the idea behind the work of Shoji Takuchi at the University of Tokyo in Japan, who has been wrapping robots in human skin. In the case of this experiment, just a finger first, but they hope to be wrapping entire robots in skin in the very near future. The key, and I think this is what I find most bizarre, is they are doing it to try to make us feel more at ease with the robots. He says, as robots increasingly take on roles as nurses, care workers, teachers, and other jobs that involve close personal contact, it's important to make them look more human so we feel comfortable interacting with them. So at the moment, robots are given this kind of silicon fleshy rubber a lot of the time to try to imitate human skin, but because it just doesn't have the texture of it, it isn't realistic at all and it's very obvious that it's kind of just a silicon layer around the robot. To make this more realistic skin, Takuchi and his colleagues bathed a plastic robot finger in a soup of collagen and human skin cells called fibroblasts for three days. The collagen and fibroblasts stuck together and formed a layer similar to the dermis, which is the second from top layer of human skin. I think even when you're listening to this for the first time, um, I definitely appreciate how weird it sounds, like you just stick something in a soup and like woo, skin forms. But I did a few modules about this in my masters and it's sort of, like it, obviously it's complicated, but in some ways it really is that simple. Like you'd be surprised how much of the time you can just sort of, with the right potions, you can just like stick stuff in and you know, tissue is grown or regenerated, like it's, it's, it's pretty mind-boggling, actually. Next, they gently poured a layer of other skin cells called keratinocytes over it to form the next layer of skin called the epidermis. The resulting skin around that little robot finger, <laughs> I need to put my hand down and stop doing that, was 1.5 millimeters thick and able to contract and stretch as the finger moved. And it wrinkled like normal skin. I haven't seen it, but Takuchi, who I guess is the creator of it, describes it as much more realistic than silicon. And seeing as it is literally skin, um, lab grown but it is skin nonetheless, I do sort of believe him. And if that wasn't wild enough, the skin also had the ability to heal itself. If you cut it, you could just graft a sheet of collagen over the top and the collagen, which is a really big part in skin healing, like in our skin when we cut ourselves, would heal the wound. There is still quite a lot of progress to be made on this, so I think one of the biggest practical issues they found was because there are no blood vessels supplying the skin with moisture, the skin did actually dry out quite fast, and I think after a few days it was shriveled and disgusting. I actually can't find any photos of it, but we can just imagine, we can just imagine. Scary, shriveled robot finger. For Takuchi, the next step is to try to incorporate artificial blood vessels into the skin to keep it hydrated, as well as sweat glands and hair follicles to make it more realistic. It should also be possible to make different skin colours by adding melanocytes, he says. And as I mentioned earlier, upcoming research will see them try to coat an entire robot in human skin. Excited for that update. He does note though that since this research field has the potential to build a new relationship between humans and robots, we need to carefully consider the risks and benefits of making it too realistic. What I found interesting, and especially when I was reading about the 
kind of aims to put hair follicles in there and pores is that robots are being made to look more human and the idea is we're trying to make them more appealing to humans by adding hair follicles and pores and things whereas humans to try to be more appealing to humans are working to remove hair follicles and pores and like skin texture through treatments and filters and like makeup and like a lot of makeup will literally describe itself as making you poreless and stuff like that and like I'm probably deeping it but I do just find it kind of ironic anyway though it is incredible that this is possible um, my initial reaction and maybe I'm just being closed-minded was will this not be just really quite creepy? <laughs> you may be familiar with the uncanny valley, which is hypothesized as an unsettling feeling people experience when androids, so humanoid robots, and audiovisual simulations closely resemble humans in many respects, but are not quite convincingly realistic. So they're kind of almost there, but not quite. The concept suggests that humanoid robots that imperfectly resemble actual human beings provoke uncanny or strangely familiar feelings of uneasiness and revulsion in observers. Valley denotes that dip in the human observer's affinity for the replica, a relation that otherwise increases with its human likeness. Popular examples of this include the CB2 child robot with its lifeless eyes and biomimetic body and Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> I'm genuinely probably only about 10% joking about Mark. I actually think that he's quite a good example of the uncanny valley. Like all of the memes and jokes are centered around the fact that he looks sort of human, but has incredibly awkward movements or a weirdly pasty face. Like he actually probably does technically fall into the uncanny valley, which is, I've never thought of it that way before. So that's unnerving. Mark, if you're listening, which I'm sure you always are. Actually, I don't have an apology, sorry. <laughs> when I read about the robot skin experiment, the first thing I thought of is the uncanny valley. So how would we help these robots that Takuchi and his team are making escape the valley? Assuming that we're sitting at the bottom of the valley, the only way we can really go is to the left or to the right. So we could make something more human-like and climb out that way or more robot-like and climb out that way. Let's consider the former. So let's say that Takuchi and his team succeed in making skin suits for the entire robot and the robot kind of pulls them off, you know? They're not any old suits, they're kind of designer skin suits. They're like the sort of Burberry of the human flesh suit in a robot world. We've got aesthetics, at least, motionless aesthetics nailed down. Now, what else do we need to make it more human? Well, Robin Reed at Plymouth University and his colleagues have been working on this question and have built robots, programming them to make sounds. Reed and his colleagues created two sounds, a chirpy, positive sounding bleep and a sad whine. They then recorded footage of the robot making this sound after having a few interactions. So. The robot would make each sound after being slapped, kissed, stroked, or having its eyes covered. They then asked 300 people to rate how they perceived the robot's feelings after each action. In general, people had a similar response to each sound, but they found that people were more engaged when the robot made a sound than when it didn't make a sound. Reed cited it as an easy way to provide rich expressions for robots. So just providing it with these two simple sounds already, you could really help people interact with it, help them distinguish what the robot was feeling. But there's more. Sean Andrist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his team have been working on other ways to make these robots seem more alive. So not just about sounds, it's not just about how it looks, but also how it moves during interactions. One of the ways was to introduce random movements into the way that the robot moved its head. So all these things are programmed and instead of programming it to smoothly move its head from one side to rotating it to the other, 
Every so often, the robot's head would move in a sort of very small but unexpected way. The robot is also programmed to locate eyes and give eye contact, but again, the team programmed it so that it would occasionally look away, and especially when it was asked a question, there would be a very fleeting moment of looking away to kind of imply it was thinking, similar to the way that humans move. 30 students were then asked to assess conversations with Neo robots programmed to act like li librarians or job interviewers, some of which had been set up for gaze aversion, so the thing that I just described where they're kind of looking away when they're thinking. They found that people thought robots that glanced around seemed more purposeful and thoughtful. The glances also led to fewer inappropriate interruptions in a conversation with the robot. Moving on to another study, we look at how gaze plays another important role. So using a PR2 humanoid robot, Ajung Moon at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, found that for people to feel more comfortable when a robot hands them an object, it's crucial that they lock gaze first. Then the robot must look to the point in space where it plans to make the handover. So you've got this sequence of movements that we don't really consider ever, but is actually really important to what makes our movement human. This can be improved further, says Anka Dragon at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, who has experimented with introducing a tiny delay to the robot human handover. This delay was enough to mimic a natural human hesitation, even if it made the overall handover less smooth. It may seem less efficient, but people take to these small differences in robot behavior, says Dragon. Such handover motions have to match human expectations, she says. You don't want the robot moving in ways that surprise or shock people. I found it really interesting how if a robot is too smooth, too accurate, just like too good at a human movement, it has actually stopped being believable. And we're trying to introduce ways for it to be, I guess, bad at these movements or behaviors but in a human way. In my opinion, the robots that are the least scary are the ones that happen when you climb out of the uncanny valley the other way. The ones that are obviously robots, obviously highly functional, and we aren't trying to make them look like humans. I think even the most realistic robot ever, at least in this day and age, you know, we're not used to these things. Even the most realistic robot ever, I don't think, if we knew it was a robot, we would really want it to look that similar to a human. And maybe that's just the human ego, but it's how I feel RN. I think just something purely functional, so like a toaster, they're not scary usually, um, where it's not trying to be anything it's not, it's just here to toast your toast, and there it is. But I guess there are some much more complicated actions that maybe some people do want a robot to do for them and seem human while doing it but i just can't imagine it right now anyway i hope you enjoyed this video if you did then i feel like you'll quite enjoy last week's one on the weird little animal that survived quantum entanglement also please like this video and subscribe to my channel again um, it gives me tremendous validation and what am i here for if not to harvest validation thank you for watching i will see you next week